A very good afternoon to you all. Today we are going to discuss a very important topic of spontaneous hypoglycemia, also referred to as non-diabetic hypoglycemia. And yes, we'll do it via a case-based approach. So as I mentioned, today's topic is about a non-diabetic hypoglycemia, which is also referred to as spontaneous hypoglycemia. So let's start right away. So the case history is of a 55-year-old man who is referred to the endocrinology clinic with a six-month history of funny turns. These episodes have been occurring with increasing frequency and now are happening every other day. The patient reports that during a typical episode, he notices his vision becoming blurred and he also feels nauseous. He is aware of his heartbeat thumping and feels very hungry at these times. And the symptoms usually pass when he has something to eat. So clearly demonstrating a possible hypoglycemic episode. On some instances, he has undoubtedly become muddled, so appearing confused. And also on one occasion, uh, his wife had to actually call an ambulance because she could not rouse him from the sleep. The ambulance crew had found his capillary blood glucose to be low. So again, we have a documented low blood sugar reading as well. So clearly the symptoms of hypoglycemia, which get relief by the eating something. And third, a documented low blood sugar. And this was relieved by administering an intramuscular glucagon by the ambulance crew. He had recovered quickly following the injection and was not taken to the hospital. So... As I mentioned in this case history, we clearly have the three essential components of what we refer to as the Whipple's trial, which is necessary for making the diagnosis of a hypoglycemic disorder. <clears throat> the first of it, component of it is the symptoms suggestive hypoglycemia. The second component is recovery following ingestion of the food. And the third component is a presence of a potential diagnostic blood test that was recorded as low in this patient by the ambulance crew. So the endocrine society guidelines recommends investigation in a patient whom Whipple's trial is fulfilled. So there are a very good set of guidelines from endocrine society about this concept of non-diabetic hypoglycemia and hypoglycemic disorders. And that is what I'm going to base my case on in the subsequent slides. So let's start off looking at this from uh, Oxford Handbook about the symptoms of hypoglycemia. They can be divided into two types, adrenergic, which are sweating, hunger, tingling, palpitations, trembling, and anxiety, or they can be neuroglycopenic, which we refer to as visual disturbances like diplopia, bird vision, poor concentration, drowsiness, which were actually occurring in this patient, lethargy, unusual behavior, personality change, confusion, seizures, coma, and focal neurological abnormality. Now, many a times we are asked again the cutoffs at which these symptoms start, cutoffs for the blood sugar. So in the Oxford Handbook, it is mentioned adrenergic symptoms have been identified at arterialized plasma glucose concentrations of 3.3 millimole per liter, which is equivalent to a venous plasma concentration of 3.1. Whereas the neuroglycopenic symptoms have been identified at an arterialized plasma glucose concentration of 2.8, which is equivalent to a venous plasma concentration of 2.6 millimole per liter. So very important to know this numbers because many frequently it's asked in the exams. EEG changes occur at two millimole per liter. So clearly these important symptoms of hypoglycemia, which we should keep in our mind, divided into adrenergic and neuroglycopenic. And in our patient, we could clearly see the neuroglycopenic symptoms as well. Then we ask the patient for the symptom history. When do the symptoms occur? The second thing is how do they relate to the meals and exercise? The traditional classification of hypoglycemia in persons without diabetes was by, we call it a like fasting hypoglycemia, also referred to as post-absorptive hypoglycemia and post prandial hypoglycemia also called as reactive hypoglycemia. Now, typically, 
we were aware of these two traditional classifications uh, when we are talking about hypoglycemia in persons with diabetes. But what we should know that persons with an diagnosis like insulinoma who typically have a fasting state hypoglycemia may also experience postprandial hypoglycemia. So it's not a hard and fast rule that we should have only fasting hypoglycemia in insulinoma. Whereas post-gastric bypass patients who we traditionally know will have only postprandial hypoglycemia or reactive hypoglycemia may even have the symptoms while fasting. So hence, we should try to not just uh, put that thing in our mind that it will only occur in the fasting state from insulinoma or, or it will only occur in the uh, postprandial state for a post-gastric bypass patient. Both the scenarios can happen in both these diagnoses. So this is very important to keep in our mind, okay? Now, a more useful categorization for the clinician is to establish whether the patient is seemingly well or has the burden of a potentially relevant treatment or disease. So this is a more useful classification of hypoglycemia in persons without diabetes. With respect to the latter, it can be overemphasized that in any patient with hypoglycemia, mediation by a medication must be considered. So if there is an underlying drug which is causing it, we should definitely consider that. So this classification now uh, uh, advised in the Endocrine Society guidelines as well, as well as there in the Williams textbook of endocrinology, which we'll look at in the next slide. Now, the next group of questions, which is very important to ask, is try to look for any underlying causes. The most important question to ask for is, what medication are you taking? Clearly, the most common cause of hypoglycemia is either insulin use or a sulfonylurea therapy for diabetes. But even in people with a diabetes, drug therapy is a very important precipitating factor and that should be looked for. The differential diagnosis is completely different in a hospitalized patient where liver disease and sepsis will predominate, even for that matter, renal failure, compared with an outpatient setting. And there are certain causes which may be more prevalent depending upon the geographical location. So for example, falciparum malaria as a cause of hypoglycemia and consumption of an unripe ackee fruit may, some, may be the cause of hypoglycemia in some parts of the world, depending upon their geographical variation. Now, again, these are endocrine society uh, recommendations. They recommend uh, evaluating and pursuing the possibilities of medication-induced hypoglycemia, we know that. Also, try to look for if there is any critical illness, organ failure, and or hormone deficiencies like cortisol deficiency, if there is liver failure, kidney failure, adrenal insufficiency, or for that matter, even growth hormone deficiency, all of them can be the causes of hypoglycemia. Also then they said we should evaluate if there is any cause for endogenous hyperinsulinism. So what are the causes of endogenous hyperinsulinism? Insulinoma, post-gastric bypass hypoglycemia, insulin autoimmune hypoglycemia, an accidental or uh, surreptitious insulin secretagogue injection, which we are talking about sulfonylureas and megalitinides. Again, we should look for if there are any clues of underlying malignancy or identification of a large new mass, which may point towards the diagnosis of a non islet cell tumor hypoglycemia. This all should be evaluated for. Now we'll be looking at each and every one in the next set of slides but this is the brief recommendation from the endocrine society, how we should proceed with the evaluation of this patient. So in our patient on further symptom history, the symptoms were occurring in the fasting state and also he was having recurrent episodes. These episodes were associated with confusion, psychosis and amnesia in our patient. And so clearly he had already nucleoglycopenic symptoms and he was very feeling very fatigued at these times along with sweating. He also gave a three-month history of diffuse abdominal pain. However, there was no constipation, no diarrhea, and no other genital urinary symptoms. And there was also no history of any weight loss. So apart from the symptomatic hypoglycemia fulfilling the Whipple's triad, he was otherwise appearing well. And of course, his symptoms were not only limited to the adrenergic symptoms, which we looked at. They, he clearly had neuroglycopenic symptoms as well. So this is the classification which we should 
apply in the patients who are having hypoglycemia without diabetes. Okay, so this is what is uh, present in up to date as well as in the endocrine society guidelines as well as in the Williams. So first we are talking about insulin or insulin secretor goal. Here we are talking about sulfonylureas or megalidinides. Then there can be other agents like alcohol. Drugs often in the setting of critical illness, including renal failure, are by far the most common cause of hypoglycemia in a hospital setting. There are some other drugs as well, which we should look at, which I have mentioned here, which are referred to as having a moderate quality of evidence. This we should know. So this is the sibenzoline, gatifloxacin, pentamidine, quinine, and indomethacine. So these are all the drugs which have a tendency to cause hypoglycemia. What about critical illnesses? As we discussed in the previous slide, if a patient is having a hepatic failure, renal failure, or cardiac failure, the patient is sick, hypoglycemia can happen. Sepsis, including malaria, uh, hypoglycemia can happen. These are all things we should keep in our mind. Hormone deficiencies, if there is a cortical deficiency, adrenal insufficiency or hypopituitarism for that matter, hypoglycemia can happen. Even if there is a growth hormone deficiency, I told you all in the previous slide, again, hypoglycemia can happen. And even if there is a glucagon and epinephrine, in insulin in deficient diabetes mellitus patients as well. The other cause in an ill or a medicated individual is a non islet cell tumor. Okay, so non islet cell tumor hypoglycemia also a part of the differential diagnosis of a hypoglycemia in an ill or a medicated individual. Now let's look at seemingly well individual. So the free view of this particular lecture has ended. Uh, for access to this full lecture session, please subscribe to my lecture series, which is total of 60 lectures till date. Uh, these uh, will be provided access to via paid subscription plan. And uh, all the paid subscribers will be given a lifetime access to all my existing 60 videos lectures, which are already on the YouTube channel, plus all the upcoming new videos. So whatever lectures or sessions I'll be doing in coming weeks, months, and years, all of them will be uh, given access to in the same subscription plan. So for the full subscription details, please email me on mazirules at gmail.com or WhatsApp me on 0097155743 and have the same number on the Telegram app as well. Uh, just to give a brief overview of the full lecture series. So it includes uh, different topics across diabetes and endocrinology. For diabetes itself is there are around 19 lectures which I've done across different topics which are useful for the exams as well as for the clinical endocrinology practice. In terms of uh, high yield topics for speciality exam and European board exam, there are around nine sessions which have covered all the previous exam recalls as well as all the high yield topics and themes which are frequently encountered in the uh, speciality exams and the European board exams. In terms of thyroid, apart from the thyroid cancer guidelines, which were recently uh, published, plus there are other sessions on different topics uh, related to thyroid uh, across the spectrum of thyroid disease. In terms of adrenal as well, covering all the important topics or sessions which are frequently encountered in exams and in clinical practice. There are two very good sessions on lab endocrinology by Dr. Well Murugan. Very helpful for those preparing for uh, DM endo or DNB endocrinology as well. In terms of pituitary also have covered all the important sessions on all the important topics which are frequently encountered in clinical practice and the exams. There are a few sessions on the inherited endocrine syndromes as well. Very important sessions on reproductive endocrinology about uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, gynecomastia, hirsutism, because diagnosis, evaluation, management. There is a sessions on calcium and bone metabolism, on familial lipid disorders, and uh, sessions on pediatric endocrinology as well. So just to let you know that there are many more sessions coming up. And as I mentioned, that in the same subscription plan or same subscription fee, you will be provided access to all my existing 60 lectures plus all my forthcoming lectures. So thank you very much for subscribing. Thank you very much for supporting.